Thank you. Um, it's a good chance to talk here, and I think there are, um, I'm, I'm only having a certain familiarity with this very brand new topic, and I'm sure there are a lot of experts in the audience, so don't hesitate to make comments if I miss something. But um, so I think I already have enough materi material, so I think I will be just focusing on this theorem um, by Bergen and Samuel, um, which is also known as the fractal uncertainty principle, I will say, on the Euclidean line. So um, this one actually um, is quite interesting, as you probably have seen, um, uh, for, for both if we have two like fractal sets with, which are both delta regular, which means they behave roughly like a delta dimensional set from a certain scale to um, another, which um, was mainly because we were taking neighborhoods of, as you've probably seen from the last talk, we've, we're taking neighborhoods of certain sets, so um, we don't see anything below the minimal scale. So it's somewhat convenient to introduce this delta regular um, uh, concept that you, you've already seen in the last talk. Um, and um, the, f the fractal uncertainty pr principle says that um, if we have some function um, it's Fourier, whose Fourier transform is supported on some fractal set, and uh, the function itself, th then the, the part of the function itself on a set which is also fractal, which is uh, in sort of a dual scale, uh, would be bounded by a non-trivial power saving of the whole thing, the whole L2 norm of the of f on the whole thing. So um, one one thing that was mentioning was that uh, the original proof of this in the original proof of this, so um, the power saving w you will have this a beta if you were in the discussion yesterday, um, you probably knew that um, this beta um, presumably is very small at least for the discrete set. So for the discrete, for, for example, can, counter set, um, uh, you get some like double exponential thing, which is very weak. And I think in the original proof, um, this beta wasn't effective. That's because um, there was some, some like um, contradiction argument involved. But um, I think there are multiple ways to work out an effective beta. And um, so there's, there's a result by Long and myself which is just a refinement of this. So making this beta effective. So so um, um, our approach will yield a beta to be, you can see, quite small. It's a double exponential thing um, in delta, in particular. So k here is a universal constant. So you can see, quite small. And um, but uh, if you were in again, if you were in the discussion yesterday, you will see that for Cantor set, this is probably not too far from the truth. So um, um, like the the unusual approach that we'll see like um, in the rest of this talk on, on this problem might actually not be a too bad one. So um, my task here will be um, explaining uh, like the approach, how do we prove this theorem, and uh, saying a little bit about how will we obtain an effective bound. So um, OK. So um, I think it's good to recall a few basic properties um, of these um, delta regular sets. So, um, so let's see basic properties. I'll probably just put down what's, uh, what's uh, useful in the proof. But I will start by um, property 0, which is um, the advantage of this concept of delta regular, which uh, already didn't exist. But um, so it turns out that this uh, measure theoretic definition behaves very well under diffeomorphism um, of the real line, which is what you need like in the real situation. 
So that's, that's one thing it behaves very well under different morphisms. And uh, um, there's another um, somewhat easy thing, which is um, you can raise the upper bound by a constant multiple, which doesn't, doesn't really hurt you. So that's, that's one technicality. And um, there's another thing that I, I've already said, um, which is you can consider um, the, uh, the neighborhood. Uh, so for example, if you can consider, um, so our x here, um, say, is from scale, um, say, alpha 0 to alpha 1, then the neighbor, the t alpha 0 neighborhood, so t will be a constant here. So r roughly behave like a constant. So the t alpha 0 neighborhood um, of this set, which is defined as So um, this is also delta regular, um, like from a constant multiple of alpha 0 to alpha 1. So it's like um, it's convenient um, to use this language if you're always considering neighborhood, uh, neighborhoods that we always um, do. So um, now here comes the most important property, which is uh, what um, we heard a little bit about from from Samuel um, in the last talk, um, which is this uh, missing interval property. So um, I'll, I'll state it, since we're going to need it very heavily. Um, so basically it's saying, um, as you heard from last talk, if we have a delta regular set, then it's porous. So basically saying, um, if you're dividing it into sufficiently many um, intervals, depending on the CR and delta, then you always miss an interval uh, from the whole uh, fractal set. So let's see if L is large. So it should be depending on um, CR and delta. And then any interval I um, of, well, it has to be of relevant length, uh, couldn't be so small. Uh, in L alpha, L alpha 0 to alpha 1. Uh, well, since I, I omitted the definition, um, I'm, when I'm considering a general um, um, delta regular set, I always have it to be from scale alpha 0 to alpha 1. So that's the convention. So um, if we have an interval of relevant length, then, um, then the, this, this interval has to satisfy um, one of its partitions. So basically, we have this interval i. Then we're partition. We're partitioning this i equally into um, l destroying copies. So i one to i l. So so one. It turns out one of them. Um, doesn't intersect this um, delta regular set x. So um, you'll see uh, where, where we are using it in a minute. Um, but um, so there's a, there's a small remark about this. You might think like this interval um, is, is um, too arbitrary in the beginning. So what if this? It's away from this x. Well, it's OK, because um, you're missing the whole interval. So uh, you're always missing something. Um, so as a big picture, um, you'll see um, being useful from later. So for example, if we divide the real line into infinitely many um, intervals of equal length, then without knowing anything but just the delta regular property of this x, oh, sorry. Um, we will know that um, inside each interval of this um, infinite line up, there's always a smaller missing interval. And um, uh, with something that's not x. All right. <laughs> all right. So I'll just draw it over here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's a bad notation. <laughs> so x might lurk 
in in somewhere like in, in so this will all belong to x. So I think that's a that's a valid picture now. Thanks. Um, and then um, so so we have so by this property we can have like some um, other useful small conclusions. For example, um, the the big measure of this delta regular set in uh, like relevant scales will behave like a delta dimensional set. For example, this delta regular set can be covered by relatively reasonably num number of small intervals in like uh, um, relevant scales, just again behaving like a, a delta dimensional set. So basically, every, um, every piece of intuition um, about like delta dimensional set will basically apply to delta regular set here. So don't worry too much about that. And uh, I think so much for preparation. Now um, let's explore the proof strategy of this uh, inequality one. So um, it turns out that um, the starting point of the proof will be a very good property, um, much relevant to this, this missing interval property. So um, since um, we have this missing interval in each, um, in inside each larger interval, once we divide this, uh, the whole real line into infinite man many of um, intervals of equal length, um, it's conceivable that, um, well, since the intervals um, don't intersect x, uh, well, if on those intervals we have a positive proportion of the L2 mass, then um, since everything is missing from x, we know that we get some saving of the L2 norm, like that, that, so that those savings doesn't meet this set S. And we can also iterate this pro process. Like in, we can do this to the next scale, which means that we divide the large, for example, if we start from, uh, from this j to j plus 1, for example, then the next scale, we divide this into um, L square small intervals. And again, we have some um, smaller missing intervals over there. So um, if we iterate, um, so let's summarize um, our observation by missing interval. Um, so we can basically choose how many scales. Well, um, each time we we get a like multiple of this L. So our scales are from n inverse to one. So roughly um, log of n. So here L can be viewed as a fixed number. So these different many um, scales. Um, they're from a geometric uh, progression. So each scale, let's see, at each scale, this x is missing. Um, let's see. We can call it um, arithmetic infinitude of smaller intervals. Um, I'll emphasize they're of the same size. So um, if we're missing also a possible portion of the whole L2 mass here, then we're almost down. Because you can see we can iterate roughly log n steps. And each time, if we have a constant, then we'll eventually get a power of n. So uh, that's basically what, we're, what uh, was done in um, Bergen and Samuel's paper. Um, and that happens to be true for the functions who have their Fourier support in the dual uh, fractal, just like you've seen here. So basically, um, um, <coughs> let's summarize up. So, but if the Fourier transform of f is in this dual fractal set, um, so, and in practice, also neighborhoods of the fractal set um, as a technicality, um, but as we said, like it behaves well undertaking neighborhoods, 
So um, it has a positive proportion. of L2 norm on the union of those intervals. So basically, uh, that's what we're going to prove next. And once we have this, we can iterate these uh, roughly log n steps. And then we get a power saving. So um, let's see, iteration. So give constant to the negative log n, roughly a negative power of n saving. So uh, well, one technical remark about this, so this is essentially true. But in practice, you couldn't do things like this. Because uh, once you, if you do the like, sharp cutoff here, then, then um, the, the resulting function wouldn't have its Fourier transform uh, supported um, any good fractal set anymore. Instead, like you're doing some modified, um, modified uh, truncation, which turns out to be okay. And if you work out all, all the scales, and it just worked out. So basically, I think this is morally true, and um, this will reduce our problem to one scale. So basically, reducing the problem to positive missing mass, positive proportion of missing mass at one scale. So. I'll write down the statement. So it's reduced to the following. Since this is uh, almost as, as important, I'll just uh, write down the whole proposition again. So if we have some y, some fractal set on the frequency side in minus alpha 1 to alpha 1, uh, being delta regular uh, with constant CR um, on scales 1 to alpha 1. Um, let's take let's take a, a partition of the real line to integer intervals. So let's take this partition um, I to be the inter integer intervals in the real line. And um, we assume that we are missing um, one interval from each, each step of the partition. So we assume for any i in this family, um, we are given a smaller i prime lying in this i. This will be uh, our missing interval. And um, such that they have certain lengths. C1, um, let's define capital U prime equals to the union of all of them. So basically, u prime will be union of all those missing intervals in practice. And then um, we would have, um, so I'll write the conclusion right here. Then for any f um, in L2, so support of the Fourier transform inside this um, fractal set, we would have The L2 norm of the whole U prime thing is larger than the constant multiple, depending on delta CR and C1 of the whole L2 norm. So um, as you can see, uh, we can just forget about the original fractal uncertainty principle. And uh, by the, the above reduction, if we are able to prove this proposition, then we, we will obtain the fractal uncertainty principle. So um, we can. From now on, just forget this inequality one and try to uh, try to prove this one. It turns out this is true, which is a lifesaver in like our situation. So um, I think it's good to put two more remarks. So the first remark is that you can see like 
we have a bunch of different um, parameters. But it's important that this dependence, um, <coughs> this one doesn't depend on this scale alpha one. So you will see the reason in a minute. So basically, this alpha one is re really a mild thing. Um, and the second one is that um, it's a weird, it might s sound a weird move to take the union of all the smaller intervals. But um, as is also remarked in the original paper by Bergen and Samuel, uh, you couldn't just take one interval. That just wouldn't work. So you would have to take uh, like an infinitude of um, intervals lying in this particular way. And then this will give you a very nice uh, power saving here. Um, I mean, constant saving. So, so um, let's do the proof, and which, make, which will make the um, key component of the whole thing. But since it's very complicated, I can just do the sketch. So um, basically, I would, I would like to think it um, of a composition of three to four steps. So first of all, um, how can something like this be true? Well, um, in general, we want, um, so on the left-hand side, we have the L2 norm on like a union of smaller intervals. But on the right-hand side, we have the whole thing. So that means that, that means we have to bound, for example, the value of f here in terms of those values like inside those given intervals. So uh, well, this is generally not possible. But um, a first step is to notice that, well, um, if for some reason the, um, the Fourier transform of this f is completely supported, then um, this f is going to be holomorphic. And you can take the two boundaries here on the um, complex plane. That will help us. So um, that's the first step of reduction. So um, let's see. Um, how will we? So um, here is the so-called harmonic measure part of the paper. Harmonic measure enables us to bound this um, desired f of x um, in terms of of say f is L2 norm on u prime um, and some very bad thing. So um, if you think about it, the magnitude of, um, of the holomorphic f on these two lines, say if this is r, then this can be bad as, as bad as e to the 2 pi r cos c, um, f hat of cos c. Uh, L2 norm of that, um, so by, by a simple computation. So um, this looks very scary. Uh, but um, let me just um, give him a little more details on um, this proof before, before we proceed. So how they, how they were able to carry out this was that um, since this is um, holomorphic here, then um, if you take the logarithmic of the absolute value, which might be familiar to many of you, which will be, it will be like a subharmonic. Harmonic. And um, since it's a subharmonic function, the, f the value of the function here can be bounded by um, the value of the functions on the boundary, on the boundaries uh, integrated against the harmonic measure. And um, so, so, um, so yeah, yeah, it's the the supreme norm. But uh, I mean, for different for for different x, the harmonic measure will be different. Yeah, right. So yeah, yeah. So, so. The value at a point. Yeah. You're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I'm taking okay. a point. Yeah. So mention what the domain is here. Yeah, the domain. Uh, I'll I'll mention it in a bit. Maybe let me just put down, well, what's in the paper? What's the final conclusion? And then, um, and then say like, uh, what the domain looks like. So, um, the conclusion of this step would be the L2 norm um, of f squared would be less than, since we're taking logs, so we'll obtain some 
geometric meaning, geometric mean inequality. So f l2 of u prime raised to some certain power 2 kappa and e to the 2 pi r c f hat of c l2 raised to power 2 times 1 minus kappa. In this kind of yeah. harmonic measure argument, as you said, what the harmonic measure of which set can you compute? Yeah, yeah, I will, I will talk about that in, in a minute before, uh, after stating this. Uh, this inequality. So in practice, this will be constant. This r would just be a uh, constant to be chosen later. Um, and um, let's see. So c will be depending on uh, uh, <coughs> little c0, um, which I think, um, yeah, I'm a little bit confused about this c0. So. C1, I suppose. Oh, yeah, C1. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Um, so it's a geometric mean inequality obtained by harmonic measure, as yeah. I said. Um, yeah, uh, that's important. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so kappa will be something in the range between 0 and e to the minus c over r. So um, that's the numerics behind here. But um, I'll just talk about what you're going to do it. So you're going to look at this domain, which is, uh, which is a strip missing, um, missing a line segment. And then you're going to compute um, the harmonic measure here. Um, so well, it's kind of hard to compute, but you have the comparison theorem of harmonic measures uh, by, for example, the Brownian motion, uh, Brownian motion uh, explanation. So meaning that if you want, say, an upper bound of the harmonic uh, measure here. One interval? Yes? Two strips. What's the exact uh, so, uh, so this is, this will be the real. The the yeah, and then, and you have one interval. interval and so, two. yeah, and two strips. So the height will be like r here. That's why you have a parameter r in the end. And then, and then um, you end up um, integrating this inequality over many intervals. And then you will get, you will get um, the desired inequality. But um, in computation aspect, um, so the harmonic measure of this thing is very hard to compute. But you can use the comparison theorem, for example, to show the measure here is less than the measure if you just enlarge the whole domain to the um, whole complex plane just missing this interval. And then that will be much easier to compute. And that's how they did the computation. And then um, if you carry out all the numerics, you'll, you'll obtain like, um, the above inequality. So um, we've succeeded in bounding the whole L2 norm by this L2 of u prime uh, plus some uh, very nasty term. So how we save our life in this situation? Um, no, I'll just. <coughs> Write down the problem here. Right, yes. Asking, you really can't do better by estimating the harmonic measure if you have several intervals. Well, uh, you, uh, one can make yeah, you probably can, but uh, I suspect because uh, in the in the computation, the skill is just to dis discard a lot of components of the boundary. The so yeah, those will be. I have no idea how one, one is going to compute that, <laughs> to be honest. But these are regularly spaced apart here, right? Yes. So it's like you have a very, the strip is very thin. R will be quite small. Yes, And this, in the, the size of the interval is C1, which is just a fixed yeah, bottom just, number. Uh, wait, wait. So if you start a Brownian motion somewhere on the real line, most likely you're going to hit the up or bottom part of yeah, the Yeah, in the, cl the close region. That's one minus kappa probability that you hit yeah. top or bottom. And with probability yes. kappa, you'll hit the closest yeah. interval, and if you look at hitting some other much farther interval, it's yeah. much smaller. Those probability. might be like even even summable. Or, or yeah, so probably yeah. it's yeah. the probability that you hit this. Uh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's summed over all. Yeah, but in the end, you're integrating over this estimate. So yeah. for each point, you're basically looking at the closest uh, interval. Yeah. That's a good point. <coughs> yeah. So and yeah. So that's why like this might might be already enough. Um, so the problem here. Apparently, as everyone notices, so it's the second term being too large. So, 
So, uh, but there's, there, there might be some trick that we can do. Well, since f hat is just supported on this delta regular set y instead of whole space, um, we might try to find some modifier um, so that after convolution with this f, then this Fourier transform will become its Fourier transform times the uh, f hat. Then um, you might hope that um, it results in a very small thing that can actually beat this. So that's indeed the next step we're looking for, and that's relevant to this um, berlin maliavan theorem that we're talking about all the time. So you that yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'll, uh, let me just um, again go over the redu reduction first and see the why. Why do we need such a theorem? So um, so let's see. Um, we may apply. Let's call this uh, inequality two. So we may apply these two to some certain f convolved by some per c. So um, or some f eta, as in their paper, convolved by per c, where this f eta is just a phase translation where eta is just a real number, say, a mild translation. So um, then um, we want per c to be with the following good properties. So um, we want per c hat to decay very fast on this capital Y. So that um, once we replace f by f um, convolved with per c, or any of those f eta convolves with per c, then we will get a tremendous saving that will eventually beat this to be an essential L2 bound or h, h minus 10 norm bound, which is summable in the end. Uh, that's also used in the paper. So um, we want this thing. And so let's look at. Uh, if we are qualified to use this kind of um, functions, so um, we were we were focusing we were focusing on um, the norm of this kind of function on uh, um, like a, on a union of a mi missing intervals. So, um, but if we look at this one instead, then this value, for example, on one of the missing intervals, will be affected by its neighborhood depending on the support of Per C. So um, what we want is that, um, for example, there's some term um, that's just on the missing intervals. So we can, for example, um, accept enlarging them a little bit. Uh, but you still want a set, a set of missing intervals. You don't want the whole thing. In that case, like you, that will cause parent problem. So in that way, you, you have to force the support of your per C to be very restricted. Uh, I mean, compact, compact supported, of course. And you want it to be small, say, smaller than size C1. So um, let's um, summary, summarize this to be um, support of per C, say, in the composite of, of R, or even uh, minus, say, C1 over 10 to C1 over 10. Um, so I'll, I'll write it down. So that uh, the value of um, f eta convolved with per c um, on u prime is um, exclusively related to the value of f eta on, say, u prime tilde. So u prime is the union of those. And u prime tilde will be the union of larger intervals. So basically, we want something like this. And um, what's the final property? Well, um, eventually, we're trying to bound, um, we're trying to bound the L2 norm of the convolved guy. Uh, 
let's say, of the convolved guy. Uh, but so what we really wanted was the L2 norm of the, the original function. So uh, we want a relation between the two. So it turns out that a proper notion is, so this is new also, um, not showing up in the original Berlin Mulliman theorem, so that we have to redo this. So this one is uh, non trivially large, um, so that, let's see. So we want this one to be non trivially large, so that. Um, Despite the fact we're just looking at the convolved function, we can still control the original function. So, so that. And that's why you also you need this eta. So that's a way of controlling the original function if you carry out the computation. But the thing you really need, really need is the average of f eta convolved with c, taking L2 norm, is larger than a constant times f. Um, well, I should, yeah, f hat taking the L2 norm between minus 1 and 1. So, yeah, there's yet another technicality um, that this L2 of minus 1, 1 is almost as good as the L2 over the whole thing. Because um, since uh, we're, we're going to get a tremendous saving from here, so that we can uh, replace a lot of L2 norm by the Sobolev norm h minus 10. So that it becomes summable over all the like frequency inter integer intervals, and uh, it wouldn't matter. So we're just doing an average over minus one and and one here, and then if you carry out the computation, um, this will be a good constraint. So um, once you have once you have all this, um, if you carry out um, the computation. You can actually obtain from this inequality the original conclusion. Um, there's one thing I haven't explored. So what what do we, what do we mean by decaying very fast? So um, well, normally if we're looking at the whole real line, um, since we already asked this perceived to be compactly supported, then this Fourier transform apparently couldn't decay like um, e to the minus two pi r c to a power, for example. Um, but um, it can um, it can decay very fast um, on on this when we're just restricting ourselves to the fractal set. So we want it to be decaying faster at least than the reciprocal of this factor, and it turns out to be possible. So I'll state this property carefully. It's going to be unfortunately another very technical property, but to be the key to find this um, modifi modifier. So the proposition, um, let's assume all stuff y in minus alpha 1 to alpha 1 and um, delta regular um, is constant CR um, on scales. Two, two, alpha one, um, delta is in zero one, and uh, we're fixing some c one larger than zero. Then there is this c two larger than zero, depending um, on delta c r and c one. Um, and a function um, per C in L2. So I think I should ap ap apology for this C1. I think it comes in some application of this theorem rather than the assumption of the original proposition. So that's what made me confused a little bit. Uh, so and the function per C here, um, and we would have. Um, to see satisfying the following property. Support of the C is in as we required minus C1 over 10 to C1 over 10. Well, actually, um, no, maybe C1, C1, sorry, C1 is the size of the smaller interval. So, sorry, 
c1 is the size of smaller interval. And uh, the L2 norm of phi hat from minus 1 to 1, as we required, required to be larger than a constant c2. So, and moreover, let's put it over here. Um, so we have a technical requirement that's not very important. So to see hat um, decays less than exponential of minus c2 Japanese bracket c raised to a half, which this one just just means um, so Japanese bracket is square root of one minus c square is roughly c, and um, this is this is uh, the general decay requirements which um, is kind of weak and um, just trying to um, kill irrelevant stuff. And most importantly, uh, we want its decay to be very fast on the fractal set. So less than exponential of minus C2. So turns out we're saving a power of log here, minus 1 plus delta over 2 times Kc. So um, that's the most technical lemma uh, in the paper by Bergen and Samuel, uh, which gives you a C that you can use to complete the proof here. But um, this lemma will be dependent on the so-called Berlin, Berlin uh, Mariavin theorem so that I'll state. Yes. Um, so basically, yeah, fixing everything, and then uh, let's say uh, there is this. Uh, there also. Uh, no, there is this. Uh, there is this uh, C two, which is also important. Oh, the, 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 the and the function. This is, uh, is applies to everything that follows. Yeah. Uh, uh, it applies to the next uh, step. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, no, sorry. You were fixing everything. Up, you were fixing everything above. Yes. And then there is this C two and the function. Good, good. Yeah. The very last line is it for C. Yes. No, the very last line is for C not for C. Uh, yeah, that's very important. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So could could you have a function like that on the entire R? Um, I I don't think so. Um, I don't think so because uh, would it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that's exactly um, why you couldn't have it on R. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's very important. Um, in our fractal uncertainty press principle that we are able to do it at all, um, that's because we, we are restricting the frequency support on this y. You can see we only need a y from the above discussion. It's a minuscule improvement. It's like a power of log. That power yeah. is log to the minus 1. Yeah. Then you yeah. can uh, do it on the entire real line. Yeah, right, right, right. Or log to the minus 1 by itself. Yes. So. Um, Could, sorry, what's the question? Could alpha and one? Why, could yeah. Could SY be delta regular on the scale two to plus infinity? Uh, I think you. I think you can. I think you can. Yeah. Yes. I think this the alpha one is really, really plays no role here. And yes, of course, uh, that would be a different condition. It's neither yeah. sweeper nor stronger. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. At some point, your yeah. set ends, and then you, if you try to take an interval which is way larger than the size of the set. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in the end of the talk, uh, maybe the next 10 minutes, I'll talk um, a little bit on about the Brulee Mollyman theorem. So, uh, so there are two um, there are two versions of these theorems. Uh, we just need one of them. So, I will just um, how how are we gonna put it? So um, we'll just state what we're gonna use. So um, that's in the paper of um, Bergen and Samuel. Um, so let C0, uh, let's see, capital C0, small c0, being both larger than 0. And omega is the weight in C1 of um, R, say mapping to 0 and 1. Um, and uh, this will be 
let's see, it's positive um, satisfy integral over r log of omega absolute value over 1 plus cos c squared d cos c is less than capital C 0. Let's call this 3. And the uh, supremum of its derivative, the, the logarithm, logarithmic derivative is controlled also. So um, then there exists some um, C0 larger than 0. Um, and a function per C in L square of R such that. Uh, sorry, I used it twice. I should use I use C. I use I, I think the name was C. I'm sorry. So C depending on capital C zero and little C zero. Um, yeah. So and the function uh, per C. Um, the support of per C is in this minus C0 to C0. And per C, um, C per C hat is bounded by some power of this weight. And uh, the L2 norm between minus 1 and 1 of per C hat, say, is larger than C. So, uh, yeah, per C hat. That's important. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. So, um, the original uh, Berlin Mulliman theorem is very much like this. So, I'll, I'll write down for comparison. Uh, maybe I can erase this. So, yeah, I think. Maybe a better way is to put this C before this weight. So this C doesn't depend on our weight. So um, the original Berlin Mullion theorem says the following. So uh, let omega satisfy. Satisfy R three and four. Um, so basically, we don't require any L two lower bound there for comparison. Uh, three and four. I haven't. Uh, yes. Basically, it's this inequality and this inequality. So basically, um, this is called the called a weight in the subject. Basically, it's saying um, for what kind of function you can um, construct some some per C that's bounded by, originally bounded by this weight. Um, so that it's, uh, it's uh, the f whose, whose Fourier transform is compactly supported. So basically, uh, uh, so the right hand, we don't have the quantifier. Um, we don't have the quantifier C0 and C0 anymore. So capital and uh, little. So where right hand ties are replaced. By, by infinity. So basically, it's saying our, if our weight satisfying the left hand side of 3 and 4 are both bounded, then we can construct some function um, who is less than this function, whose um, Fourier transform have a required um, compact uh, supportedness. So there exists uh, some function per C in L2 satisfying support of per C in minus C0 to C0. C so uh, yeah, we still keep this C0 here. And per C hat is less than omega. And just being non-zero. So basically, we non-trivially constructed some function. Who is bounded, um, yet whose Fourier transform um, has, um, <coughs> has compact support. Uh, and those are. Uh, those those are all that matters. So basically, uh, this theorem also um, has a very long history, um, and the so I I talk maybe I'll use the last five minutes to talk about the ineffective 
ineffectivity problem and where it comes from. So uh, in the original work um, by Bergen and Samuel, um, since we need, a, we, need a, we need a quantified bound of this kind of thing. Um, and um, the argument used there was a contradiction argument, saying that if you don't have this kind of, if you couldn't find this C, then you can push it further and further down, um, I think down, because when C goes down to zero, you have like loser and loser constraints here. So when you push it further and further down, you can find a sequence of counter examples, and you multiply them all together, and you get some um, uh, analytic function whose L2 norm is bounded by zero uh, in some interval, which is impossible. So this one wouldn't really give you an effective, if any effective bound without any additional work. And, um, maybe I'll just say um, in my work uh, with Sloan here, um, so we, we look through the proof of the berlin malian theorem, um, actually the proof of a, a weaker variant. Um, we also looked at the proof, but it didn't seem the proof would give anything directly either. But there's a proof of a weaker variant, which says, let's see. So. Um, um, yeah, uh, yes, in some sense. But this one, uh, which one? This is the only place where the argument is here. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, but uh, what we're really effectivizing is this. <laughs> is, yeah. Yeah. Because um, they didn't have this purpose, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I don't think they have this purpose, so they haven't We're done anything. Any yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Strictly speaking, doesn't take the no, 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 no. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's it's a good because it's a hard theorem to prove in general. Yeah, that's a good thing to clarify. So uh, let's see. What we've done was to um, go through a weaker uh, uh, a proof of a weaker, I guess, I'll do quotation because this depends on what you want. So a weaker variant um, where you can be, I would say, be more effective than you have additional bound for something related to the Hilbert transform. So the Hilbert, so H stands for the Hilbert transform of log of omega um, prime. So basically the L infinity of this guy. So it's like um, originally we just want the uh, Lipschitz norm of this log omega here. But if we also have the Lipschitz norm of the uh, Hilbert transform of this guy here, then somehow we can uh, make a more effective move and actually effectivize this. And hopefully everything was correct in the end of the day after carrying out all the computations. I think we got that double exponential thing in terms of delta. And I think I should stop here. Thanks. <laughs>